So I'm here today to talk about procedural generation, what it is and why it's relevant today. I've been doing it for nearly 30 years, and it's where art meets science. Now, all of us, without realising it perhaps subconsciously, follow rules. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, because it's behind the whole, this whole process. So think, for example, of a constable painting. It's a beautiful scene that the artist has rendered, sort of of real life, but with details subtly accentuated. It's very, very rich, and within it are a lot of rules. Think of the trees in the scene. You know, we look at the way the branches come out, how often they come out, the leaves, the colour, the bark, all of those details. You know, what makes it an oak, a hornbeam, or even a tree? And Constable was subconsciously following those very same rules when he was painting it, because it would look strange. As people, we're really, really good at spotting things that don't look right, at spotting things that break those rules. Imagine an artist's tools, an airbrush. So there's a lot of physics in an airbrush, the viscosity of the paint, the speed of the motor, where the artist holds the, um, away from the paper. And it creates a beautiful pattern in the artist's control. Now, Imagine an art package. A lot of us use art packages today rather than actual, actual paint. The designers of that art package will have exactly, as best they can, mimicked the, what an airbrush does. You know, the, the artist does the controls in very much the same way as they do with a, um, a physical airbrush. But what happens is then inside the computer it simulates that science and then an array of dots comes out, essentially with each dot coming out in a random position. Now, imagine doing that with clouds, where each little dot is a bit of cloud, or hillside, where what you're doing is you're building up piles of soil to make a landscape exactly like you, ju just what you want to imagine, like we saw in the Constable paintings. Imagine then flicking a switch and spraying again, but this time spraying trees, except where the system in enforces those rules, it makes sure the branches don't intersect, or that the trees aren't close to each other. So then imagine that artist creating many such hillsides and looking at them and tweaking them until they look like a real hillside. Now, we can aggregate that, we can look at that and build up what those rules that the artist has followed and then present back to the artist hillsides created using those same rules. Now, the artist can look at it and say, well, those trees going down to the shoreline, they don't look right, and they can, he can tweak them. And you can use that to refine the rules. But at the end of the process, you have a set of rules that creates hillsides that are pleasing to that particular artist. Now, some of you in the room will know I've been creating games for a very, very long time. And the fantastic thing with this, the sort of approach I'm talking about, procedural generation, is using it to create environments where games can take place. Huge environments to explore which are created randomly. So the great thing is, all you need to do is store those rules. Except there's, a, there's obviously a problem. Because if you're doing it randomly, it will be different every single time. And that's, that's not what we want. But then there is a magical part of mathematics, which is number sequences. This guy, Leonardo Fibonacci, um, suggested a number, number sequence in a book over 800 years ago, in 1202. And actually, even he didn't invent the sequence that's now named after him. He referred to an earlier, sadly unnamed, Indian mathematician who came up with the idea. So this sequence is a sequence of numbers where you take two numbers, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, add them together, creates another number in the sequence, and you keep doing that until you end up with an arbitrary long sequence. So we have a sequence of numbers getting ever bigger. But then imagine looking at just the last three digits of each number. They look pretty random. And the point is, think of them as dice rolls. It's a bit like knowing all of the dice rolls in advance as they come. And the beautiful thing about it is that's uniquely defined precisely by those first two numbers that we thought of, what we call the seed. So in other words, from that seed flows a sequence of numbers as long as you like, as many as you like, and they'll always be the same if you start off with the same seed. Now, um, the first game that I uh, co-wrote was a game called Elite that I wrote while at university with a colleague. And that, within it, had whole galaxies created that way. 
So from it came the name of planets, their, their position, the positions of the stars, their, their governments, their economies. It was hugely rich. And it all came for free, even the names. I remember we were looking at it, trying to get names that were pronounceable, where you didn't get phlegm on the screen, because that's what came out, using essentially things called phonemes. And I also remember having beauty parades of galaxies. We'd have whole galaxies that we'd look at and reject galaxies because they were either lopsided or they had holes in them, or they didn't quite look right. We could even make up sentences to describe them because they're also based on rules. And it's the rules here. This is where the science comes in and the art is what, is what works, what feels, what feels right. Now, procedural generation has been used ever since. Um, games like Minecraft have used it very, very successfully. But there's also bad procedural generation. We see sort of cities going on forever. We see things where you can see the patterns. They're too simplistic. It's too obviously computer generated. And the problem with that is it's, I mean, essentially it's bad art, if you like. You know, it's, it's no fault of the procedural generation. I mean, if you think of the, the earliest form of procedural generation, it's probably wallpaper, where the, the repeating pattern, the artist thinks of the pattern in such a way that disguises the fact it's going to be made on a roll, that it's got to repeat. But it's got this one overriding rule that you fundamentally can't disguise. And the fantastic, fantastic thing about the digital domain is there, there is a lot more flexibility, so the artist has much more art in it. If you like, bad procedural generation is art that hasn't felt the love of an artist. Now, this way, we can make, we can make whole planets. The amazing thing with these sort of techniques is what you can do with them. I, I still think that it's, it's a bit like going into a shop and seeing a, a Blu-ray for 10p or a brand new car for 10 pounds. It's too good to be true. But I've been doing it now for 30 years, and I haven't yet found the catch. So the moon, easy to make the moon, sphere, put craters on it to taste. Um, the other good thing is for, for Earth-like worlds, artists are great at looking at the Earth, looking at the, the various areas, you know, the tropical areas, the icy areas, and saying what looks right and what doesn't quite look right. So we start off with continents, using uh, plate tectonics, build up mountains, all that sort of thing, put water, put vegetation, put clouds. You see that clouds form in turbulent areas, downwind of mountains. But what we can also do is we can vary it. We can use the science. We know where there are cold areas, ice forms. The artists already told us that. But we also know in the boundary areas where things are in shadow, you'll see snow. You know, we know what that looks like from space. We know what it looks like on the ground. And that's fantastic. But we can also vary it. We can tilt the planet. We can cool, cool it, as you see here, where you're left with a narrow band of, that's habitable. So out of that, we get, once we've gone through this loop a lot, we get the artist is, produces a mature set of rules. But we can also apply those same rules to alien worlds, like we see here. We know the chemistry of those alien worlds. From that, we get the various colors. We know the elements and compounds that will be there. And the artist can still look at it and say, well, that doesn't look right. And we can use that to work out why it might not be right and to double check the science. Maybe we've got the viscosity of the atmosphere is wrong or whatever. Now, bizarre rules happen in the world as well. Imagine an artist, imagine Picasso. We're all very used to recognizing what is a Picasso, not just because we recognize an individual painting. We know the way he does eyes, we know the way he messes with the world, because he usually messes with the world in a very similar way. And you look at it, and you know it's a Picasso. Now, people who are expert at Picassos, they will look at it, and they will even be able to place it almost exactly when he, when he painted it, even without having seen the particular Picasso we're showing. You know, they, know, they know that because Picasso's own rules change through time. Doubtless, he didn't think he was obeying rules, but he was. That's how we recognize it as a Picasso. You know, blue period, cubism, all of that sort of thing. So summing up, this is where art meets science. It's an amazing tool in the hand of artists. You look at a place like this, look at the arches, look at all the boxes, the uniformity of it. It's beautiful. And it follows rules. And it's those rules that make it beautiful. Thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs>